remain seated for a minute. This is a song, uh, old uh, gospel song. If you know it, you can hum or sing along with me. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I am alone, when I am alone, sad and brokenhearted for the losses of this world, uh, but Lord, we are glad and celebrate uh, in what you bring for, to us, not only in this world, but especially in the world to come. And we acknowledge you as being the gospel of forever. You bring that to us, and we are so grateful and so gracious, God. So before we can praise you for anything, we've just got to say, thank you for eternity, God. It's because of you, because of what you've done in our lives. So speak to our hearts this day, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, want to talk a little bit about... Uh, <laughs> You know what's so funny <laughs> about these masks and me is that the other day I walked into a, a little convenience store, you know, and I had my mask hanging on my button right here, okay, the whole time instead of putting it on my face. I went outside and I put my mask back on <laughs> and I started driving down the road and Angela said, why do you have your mask on? I sang that whole song with a mask on. That's so funny. Just like me. Well, I want to just take a minute, just to break in worship already, uh, to talk about one of the guys that I've really just enjoyed in the, the years that I've been here in this town. 
Wade Pocket. Amen? Man, I tell you what, Wade was one of a kind. He, uh, I just printed out the obit and something's missing, so when I get there, if a sentence doesn't make sense, you, you forgive me, okay? Wade Puckett, Jackson, Wade Jackson. I didn't know that was his middle name. That's cool. Uh, 72, entered into eternal rest on October 16, 2020 at his home in Wilson. Wade was an employee of American Greetings in Osceola for almost 40 years and was a member of this church, First Baptist Church, Wilson, Arkansas. Left to mourn his passing or his wife of 50 years, Carolyn Sue Scott Puckett and her children, Christine Puckett of North Little Rock, Nathan Wade, and uh, his wife, uh, Aubrey Darling Puckett of Fayetteville, uh, Karen, which was an Aaron, and, and, her, uh, and Aaron Broach of Franklin, Tennessee. He's also survived by, and that's where it got messed up, of Meridian, Mississippi. That's his sister, I'm sure, right? Does that sound right? Uh, Wade was preceded in death by his parents, Jackson, Lee, and they great. What a great name to be uh, uh, con connected to anybody in Mississippi. Cy Puckett and Lazelle Mask Puckett of Lambert, Mississippi. And Sister Betty P. Ward, that's his sister, formerly a Frenchman's bio. Uh, memorial services will be in private. In lieu of flowers, the family requests memorials be made to this church for the pea patch. Uh, and, isn't that neat? So Wade was an encourager of the pea patch. Uh, he would always ask, what's the plan? What's going on? Things like that, you know. And uh, I, my, my personal experience with Wade was uh, that my, my best memory has been from uh, when Wade would come into church, he was prepared. If you knew anything about Wade, Wade was always prepared for what he was going to do, what he was going to say. And... Uh, I, and I've heard that he was that way as a Sunday school teacher, too. That, man, if it, you came in there, you better, you better ready for a theology class. And uh, he was going to lay it down on you. But, but for me, he would come in, and, you know, his humor and wit was just so, so strong. Uh, but it was, you know, he would come with this coy look on his face, you know. And then he would come up to me, and he'd square off, you know. And he'd say, he'd tell me a joke, or he'd tell me a witticism, you know. And he, you could just tell he was planned, he was prepared. I love that. It was so hilarious, so funny, so engaging. And when I would see him in town, uh, you know, uh, he and Sue walked a lot. It was always the same thing. He would, he would give me a quip. And, and as his uh, disease progressed, of course, <laughs> Wade would get frustrated that he would try to say something and, and, and he, he just couldn't quite get it out. And then I was always trying to help him, you know. I was not embarrassed for him, but I was trying to help. And I would try to say something, say, do you mean such and such? He'd go, no. <laughs> it was wonderful. I just enjoyed that fellow to death. Went over there the other day with the family, and I'll tell you what, I, I was so... I guess tickled, pleased would be the way to say it. Their family just huddled around each other, encouraging each other as, as much or more of any family I've ever seen. Uh, do do, do you, any of y'all have any memories of Wade that you'd like to share? I'm not going to make a big deal about that. This is very impromptu. I really didn't plan on, on saying a whole, a whole lot, but uh, anything? Yeah, yeah, BJ. They're not going to hear you on, on uh, streaming, live streaming. All right. Thank you. I'm going to get over here away from everybody. All right. Probably, I'm guessing somewhere around 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, uh, they were having a bake sale at the Cooperative Club. Does everybody remember that? Okay. And, of course, you go in and buy whatever you wanted, and, and uh, of course, Henrietta would clear them out. But Wade was over there with Henrietta one day. Now, this is a time when uh, Miss Sue, she, she didn't want him eating very much sugar at all. And so Wade comes up to Henrietta, and Wade's got his hands in his pocket, and he kind of turns sideways like he's going to say something really terrible. He said, 
would you like to be my partner in crime? <laughs> and, and Henrietta's eyes about popped out of her head, and she said, what? What are you talking about? You know, Wade is the most straightforward, I mean, he's just, that's what he is. And she said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, look, you know, Miss Sue's kind of outlawed sugar. <laughs> I really like this rum cake. <laughs> and Henrietta said, well, get it. He said, I can't take it home. <laughs> Can I stash it in your house? <laughs> of course you can. So anyway, Henrietta got the cake and brought it home. And Henrietta said, don't touch that cake, that's Wade's. And I said, well, do I need to take it to him? She said, no, he needs to stay here. I said, that's fine. The kids don't like rum cake, so that was good. So anyway, and uh, so he would see Henrietta from time to time, and he would say, look, when I do this, that means I'm coming to get a piece of cake. And so from time to time, he would come by, and he'd give that wave, and Red would meet him at the door. And here's your cake, and he would, he would you know, eat it, and he'd be gone. And so and, and it had been a few weeks, and Henrietta told him, she said, look, now this cake's not going to last forever. And she said, he said, well, why don't you do this? Let's cut it into small pieces, put it in Ziploc bags, and put it in the freezer. <laughs> she said, it won't be good. He said, I'll eat it anyway. <laughs> so this... Um, oh, one time, the last time, I think this might have been near the end of the cake. The cake was almost gone. And so we were off somewhere up at the store. And so Daly, probably, Daly was probably about eight years old maybe, I'm guessing. And so Daly says, uh, Dad, uh, why was Wade in our house <laughs> eating rum cake with a glass of milk sitting at our table? <laughs> And I said, don't worry about it. It's all good. <laughs> so that's one of the funniest memories I have of Wade. But, I mean, Wade was a great man. Yeah. And I was in his Sunday school class. And I'm telling you, you're, you're right. He was as prepared as anybody can be prepared for a Sunday school class. I mean, he was articulate. He knew every sentence he was going to say. And, I mean, he just, it was just a good class. And you learned. But you better be ready or you might get embarrassed because you wouldn't, you wouldn't be ready for it. Um, and I, I, just, I just admire the family, and I just love Wade and that whole family. So we love you, Wade. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, I'm going to make the people on streaming uh, paranoid when I start switching the camera around like that. Anybody else want to say something? Yes, ma'am. Well, here you go, streaming people. I think Wade's main obsession was food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he and Rick were big but football watching buddies. Oh. He came over every Saturday and they watched ball games together. But I think the main thing was that Rick would cook for him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he yeah, he called him Sprocket. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that was his nickname for him. But uh, yeah, he would come over and Rick would cook. He said, "This is the only time I ever get any good food." <laughs> 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 when I go see so bad. <laughs> well, that's what he said. It was uh, sweet and Sue salty had him and, on a, yeah, diet, a diet, and right. at home he was on a diet. Yeah. At our house he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but we loved having him around, and he and Rick had long conversations and, and watched those ball games and just had the best time, so and I'm, I was sad when, when he quit coming. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I love that. Anybody else? Well, oh, really? Oh, so now I, that's something I didn't know about Wayne. So he was good at fixing. Did not know that. Uh, you know, of course, I, I only began to, to know Wade at the end of his life, you know, and I uh, I do not think it was a year ago that uh, I would always see Wade and, and Sue walking, and eventually he would walk behind her, you know, a little further as time went go, would go. And, and it was just sweet, and I enjoyed visiting with them as they came by the house every now and then. And, and um, uh, one day he was out walking by himself, and it was at the point in his, his uh, disease that I thought, ooh, I'm a little uh, afraid. I wonder if who knows he's out. And so uh, like an, 
<laughs> foolish person I am, I stuck my nose in somebody else's business, and I, I, I was in my vehicle, so I just kind of creeped around the edge and watched him, and when he went around the next corner, I went, and, you know, I just didn't want him to get far, was what I was concerned about. <laughs> well, he went to guns <laughs> and bought ice cream and, <laughs> and went home. <laughs> So I don't know what his whole plan was there, but uh, it just tickled me to to no end because um, I had heard of of uh, BJ and and Henrietta's story. So uh, it's just it's good to remember him, isn't it? Let's sing a hymn, shall we? Jesus is all the world to me. You want to stand with me, please? I think we need to uh, go over. Uh, we, we've kind of changed our use of mask, and so if you, once you're in your pew and you're sitting in your pew, uh, feel free, if you're comfortable with it, to take your mask off. Uh, Sunday school is going to start next week. We're going to have, at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a kind of a coffee and donut se session for about 15 minutes, and we'll start um, uh, teaching uh, Lacey and Brooke are going to teach that uh, all, all, everyone together. We especially want the kids. We're going to do some things for the kids during that time that I'm sure uh, we uh, adults will learn from uh, well as well. Uh, but it's going to be uh, from the, the, the study that the older adult class uh, that parallels the young adult class that parallels at least one of the, the children's classes. They all kind of are on the same uh, guidelines, and, and we're going to start working on that. We're going back. We're not going to, like, jump into where li this Lifeway stuff starts this date of that day. We're going to go back. We're not going to skip around any, and we're going to kind of work our way backwards. Also reminding you, uh, you can read a little bit more about Antonio Posey working with our youth it's a young man that, that BJ and, and uh, Tammy and I got to know last year uh, in Lexington, Tennessee, when we were with the youth on a trip, and, and he's meeting with our kids every Sunday night. So we're excited about that, and the benefit of that and meeting with Osceola First Baptist kids together. Um, I call it a super group, because <laughs> they're super duper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, Angela has another Operation Christmas Child video for us to watch. 
in the scripture saying in Jeremiah that he have a future, he will not abandon us. I was born in the Philippines and growing up in a poor family and living in a tiny house, no stove. We just used wood and cooking. And growing up, um, I did not receive any gift. Sometimes we got to bed empty stomach. And when I was a child, I have favorite memory verse. It says in the scriptures in Psalms 37, 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. I decided to have my own clients, but my mom could not afford something like that. One day, our pastor inviting us for an event for the church. I saw these big brown boxes, and so my teacher handed me the shoe box. I'm so excited to open it. Teacher counted three, two, one, and then we open it together with the other kids. And when I opened my shoe box, I saw a lot of items in there, like the hygiene, I have a washcloth, pencils, and I have stuffed toys. And in my joy, I see a full box of crayons. I am grateful in that moment, knowing that there is people who pack a shoebox gift for me. And I am blessed because they uh, send me a box of gift that brings joy for me. I become a, a training teacher of the greatest journey and it's impacted to me because I see those children going to church with their families and I see their smiles and joy in their eyes that when they receive um, the shoe boxes that I felt when I was received it. I moved in the United States in 2016. I got married and I have two kids. And so I become a yearly volunteer for shoe boxes in our church. I am so grateful for being involved in this ministry in Operation Christmas Child, knowing that through packing shoe boxes, I am allowing children all over the world to the love of Christ and bring joy to them. Amen, isn't that a neat story? Uh, I can't help but think of uh, um, the Feliscos and their family being back there and the, this, the prospect of us having missionaries through Operation Christmas Child there in their own home country. Um, what a wonderful story. Um, this is our new song for this week. Would you stand with me? Sing 
that worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring you are worthy worthy of every breath we could ever bring we live for you only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my heart Today we're looking at four scripture references that are examples of what we've been talking about in our sermon series the last two weeks. My big statement for the month is only desperate people pray extraordinary prayers. The power of desperation. <laughs> and I, I have this sense. I don't, this has nothing to do with you, uh, I promise, maybe me a little bit, but, but I find myself trying to explain over and over again, I guess again to myself, what desperation is like. Because, you know, I, I got to be honest, we're pretty comfortable people. I mean, it, on the outside, it sure looks like we've got it going on. When you think about a little girl in that uh, Operation Christmas Child, the video there of uh, that she could just have her own box of crayons, you know. I remember Angela and I going a couple of years ago to hear a lady who was from the Ukraine uh, in a town where I had visited. And when she was a child, she remembered that her brother would pray before Christmas that he would get a car to play with on the ground. Uh, and that when he get, wouldn't get it, he would just continue at night when his mother would take her shoes off. He would buzz around and pretend that was a car, you know. And 
I mean, that's pretty poor <laughs> when you don't even have the toy and then you have to make up for the toy. Uh, how, how desperate a person must pray a prayer for crayons? And would God visit a child with crayons? I, I mean, I, I really, I, I, I think when I see that young lady on the, on the, the screen and I think how much must have been in her life. She wasn't searching for just crayons. She was looking for an extraordinary encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ in her life. And that's how kids express it very often. Well, last week we saw a person that had a very, uh, very interesting desire for, and desperation because he was blind. He was a beggar. And God said, what, what do you want? What are, what are you asking of me? And of course, all he could express was that he wanted to get his sight back. But you know what he got in return? He didn't have to beg anymore. He didn't have to live that life that he had lived before. He went on. Are you living the life that, 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 that God had purported, that God had prepared for you? Um, that you had reported to your friends that God had done in your life when, when perhaps you were baptized as a, as a younger person? Uh, are, are you living the life that God wants for you to live this very day? And uh, I will just remind you again the power of desperation as we will hear in these stories in Scripture and the people who experience them. These four stories in the Bible are examples of what we've spoken about in the last two weeks. They're ex they experienced brokenness. And when they did, they responded to God in repentance. And they prayed extraordinary prayers. Today, I, I would like to call this sermon the subject of this sermon, a pandemic of the soul. <laughs> because I believe God really has spoken inside the hearts of these people to their very core. And I pray he does that to us. And he creates in us a pandemic, something that changes us on a molecular scale, Let's, on, the, on that level. Okay, our first one is King Jehoshaphat. Uh, now, Angela is going to put it, she's not going to put up all the scripture because there's a whole lot, okay? We may not even be able to cover everything that I've got planned. But she's going to put in, uh, up on the screen, the page numbers, okay, to help you kind of find these stories. And this is going to be out of 2 Chronicles, okay? And uh, around chapters 19 and chapters 20 is what I'm speaking about. Uh, Je King Jehoshaphat, he was a follower of the Lord. His father at times was a follower of the Lord. He fell away and came back, fell away and came back. Uh, and so did Jehoshaphat. Uh, he had many successes in his reign, especially in the first years of his reign as he took down the Asherah poles and the high places that were meant to worship other gods. And he encouraged, he would actually, as the king, go around the land telling people that they need to follow God. But then he strayed away from the Lord. He wanted some popularity with other countries. Doesn't that always kind of get in the way when somebody, oh, I, I just want to be popular. I want to be powerful. I, want, I love it when people uh, think more of me than they even should, you know, that, that lust for power. Uh, and so what would happen is when he would stray away from the Lord, uh, his enemies would then come and fight his armies. It's as though when he was following the Lord, God protected him and people were afraid to even come and fight in Judah. But when he was not following the Lord, then they would come for battle. At the height of this, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 19 Jehoshaphat, uh, king of Judah, had just been spared his own life. The king of Israel, the lower nations, <laughs> had tried to hide and wanted everybody to think that Jehoshaphat was him, 
but they some guy just shot an arrow up in the air just to see what would happen, and it came down and killed him. In verse 9, it says these words, in the fear of the Lord. I like that, in the fear of the Lord. In other words, he had returned once again to the Lord's will in his life and in the nation. But in chapter 20, as we're going to read, uh, so it was in chapter 20 when the report came that he and his armies were prepared to be attacked. And the, the people were le less than a day away that was going to attack him. And the, the bad guys, these Moabites, Ammonites, Minuites, not the Wilsonites, they came together to fight him. And the king cries out to God. Oh, God, I don't know what to do, he says. This is the king of one of the most powerful places in the world. And he says, I don't know what to do. He found himself broken before God, humbled, out of his own fixes, out of his own ideas. And so uh, here we are in chapter 20. Verse 3. Jehoshaphat was afraid, so he resolved to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah who gathered to seek the Lord. And they came from all the cities of Judah to seek him. That is, to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem. Judah's the area and the, the tribe. Jerusalem is the town. You know that. And the Lord's temple before the new courtyard. You see, it hadn't been too many chapters before that his grandfather, Solomon, had built the temple, finally, that, that David wanted to build. So he said, Lord God of our ancestors, as a prayer, are you not the God who is in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hands, and no one can stand against you. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and who gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? We have lived in the land and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, and have said, if disasters come to us, sword, judgment, pestilence, famine, we will Stand before this temple and before you, for your name is in this temple. We cry out to you because of our distress, and you will hear and deliver. Now the Ammonites and the Moabites, and the, not the Wilsonites, but the inhabitants of Mount Seir, you did not let Israel invade them when Israel came out, out to the land of the land of Egypt, but Israel turned away from them and did not destroy them. Look how they repay us. And then in verse 13, all Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants and their wives and their children in the midst of the congregations. And the Spirit of the Lord came to Jareel, son of Zechariah, son of Banana, <laughs> son of Jael, son of Matani, a Levite, Asaph's descendant. And he said, listen, all Judah, you inhabitants, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or be discouraged because of this vast multiple. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Do y'all know a song about that? The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. The battle's not yours. It's God's. And guess what happened? I bet you can guess if you don't know that exact story. It happened over and over again in God's word. <laughs> they were successful. They were victorious. Jehoshaphat was afraid, so he resolved to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast. And they all gathered together. They turned back to God. And God said, don't worry about these people. I've got it. And you know what? He did it in such a way that they could not... 
even brag on themselves. They went over the top of the hill and God had confused all those nations coming up against them and they started fighting with each other. And when Judah's army came over the hill to the battle scene, it was strewn with dead bodies. Isn't that crazy? And God said, get this, he released them to take the plunder not God, that sounds so cruel. They actually went and took the gold. They pickpocketed the dead. God wanted them to have such a victory that there was nothing left to these people. Wiped them off. Even their gold became a possession of God's people. But that prophet simply spoke and said, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, for this is God's battle. God gave them an amazing victory. That's the posture God wants to find us in. Not the victory, but what brought about the victory. That's the position that we should take in anticipation of meeting with God. I look forward to my time of seeking God and having that, that time with God. My posture should be the same as this king when he said, I don't know what to do. I'm turning to God. I'm desperate for God to speak into my life. Just because I, Brother Paul, am not afraid of my, losing my life today, I should still be just as desperate as Jehoshaphat. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to say, Lord, we don't know what to do, but we look to you. We were broken before God, out of fixes, out of ideas, all gathered together to hear God say, don't be afraid. I got this. I will deliver you, says the Lord. And all, all, always God is faithful. Nehemiah. Well, you know, in that other, that other scripture that we just read, they were just praising God for their new, the new temple that he had built himself. And Solomon, you know, even David had collected all these goods and Solomon had, had, had built it and they had built up the walls and oh, Jerusalem was so strong. And now we get later in the, uh, new, the Old Testament, we're not so far, we're what, five, 600 years away from Jesus' life, okay? And here's Nehemiah prophesying. You remember Nehemiah was in exile. They had already been taken away. They had been ransacked and taken away from Jerusalem. So many of the Israelites were. The nation had unraveled. There were people that were still left there, but they were just few and far between. They were just barely surviving. Did you know that if you look at the book of Malachi and Ezra, those two prophets were living at the same time as Nehemiah? They probably even knew Nehemiah. Isn't that interesting? Nehemiah is unique in those latter, day, latter prophets. <laughs> we don't say latter day. Uh, latter prophets in that he, he was unique because uh, as he says in, in Nehemiah 1, 11b, at the time, I was the king's cupbearer. You see, he had been taken as a slave and eventually put into a very high position. Remember that happened to Daniel. Do you remember that? There's been other people throughout the history of God's, uh, God's chosen people, Israel in the Old Testament, who, who were slaves to begin with, and then they worked themselves up into a place of high position. He was the king's cupbearer. Did you know back then there were the king had so many people who were trying to kill him? It was, all kings were basically unpopular by being a king. Everybody hated the guy that was at the top of the pile. They were jealous. And so they were constantly trying to kill the king. So why would a cupbearer be important? Poison. They didn't want anybody slipping poison in there. And you had to have just the right person to trust, okay? You couldn't trust just anybody. Now, what would it take to go from a slave from another place that you had 
ransacked, probably killed his friends in front of him, and now you trust him more than anybody else in the kingdom. The cupbearer. He tastes the drink before the king does. <laughs> and then if he falls down and dies, the king knows he's okay, and he gets him a new cupbearer, right? But you know why Nehemiah was the cupbearer? Because he believed in God. He believed God had put him in a position for a purpose. He wasn't worried to drink that. As a matter of fact, he, I suspect Nehemiah and his faith would believe if there's poison in there, God's going to turn it to something good to drink by the time I turn it over. I mean, he believed God that much. And so the king trusted him. The life of the king was in his hands. And then when Nehemiah found out that Jerusalem, the walls had been to torn down, had been broken, the gates were burned to de and destroyed, and he was broken hearted. Jerusalem was the center, was the lifeblood, was really the heart of the nation of Israel. And his concern was not so much the government of the nation, but the God of the nation of Israel, that people would forget. People would not follow God any longer. So he prayed and he wept. And in Nehemiah 1, 1 and following, you can find that. For six months, basically, he dwelt, the scripture says, in repentance. And he became very downcast. He was concerned. It's like he had lost his, the love of his life. And finally, the one day, the king said to him, let's look in 2-2. 2-2. So the king said to me, why are you so sad when you're, you're not even sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And, and so Nehemiah says, I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Isn't that what you're supposed to say to kings? Why should I not be sad when the city of my ancestors uh, are burned and burned? and buried and lie in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And the king answered me and said, what is your request? <laughs> My friends, guess who burned the gates? The king, Artaxerxes. He did it all. He ruined everything that Nehemiah, the slave, is going to ask him to rebuild. That takes a lot of guts. You got a picture in your mind of a king sitting on a throne, and he's able to say, off with his head, right? <laughs> Nehemiah knew just because he was the cupbearer didn't mean that he was, oh, he was nervous, that he would not be just done away with just for being so bold to ask King, if it be, let's see what, what scripture. So I prayed and I asked God in heaven and, and verse 5 and answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. Six months he prayed, God, what can I do? <laughs> I'm a slave now. I'm imprisoned. I even have to go before the man who is responsible for the deaths of all my friends back in Jerusalem while I'm a slave. And, I, and, and I, how am I going to deal with this? What can I do? I'm at a loss, God. I have, I have no plan. I got nothing to offer you, God. <laughs> I'm a slave. And God says, wait a minute, Nehemiah, I got a plan. How about I tweak the heart of this man, this king? And the king changes his mind, folks. And not only does he say, yes, I'm going to send you, but guess what? I'm also going to send an army to protect you, and I'm going to send workmen 
to work for you and as you go through the other countries to get back to your homeland i'm going to give you letters so that you can purchase all the stuff that you need to rebuild those wow god's pretty good <laughs> has he ever done that for you in your life folks man i, I i'm not going to just take a, a ton of time here but i want you to know that as I look in my life, I look backwards. See, I couldn't see it going forward. But when I look backwards and I see how God intervened on my life for my behalf, I think, wow, God, you are mighty. You are amazing. You're the God of Nehemiah. Let's skip way back now to 2 Chronicles 7. This is just at the end when that temple was being finished. So David has passed, and, it, and he's passed the baton, literally, kind of, to, to his son Solomon. And Solomon, who is now the wisest person ever on the wor in the world, he has finished the first temple, and he's dedicated it to the Lord. And, and he prayed in, in, in six uh, this is Second Chronicle seven. Twelve through sixteen. And I bet you know some of this by heart. Some of y'all put this up on your memes, but look at the, the where it's from. So so he's prayed this prayer. Solomon has. And it, boy, if you want to hear a cool prayer. It's pages and pages in my Bible. Go back and read that prayer. Here's a, here's a chunk of it. Uh, this is uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 6, 12 through 16. The Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping his gracious covenant with his servants who walk before you and with your whole heart. You have kept what you promised to your servant, my father David. You spoke directly to him and you fulfilled your promise by your power as it is today. And the prayer goes on. But let me skip over to 2 Chronicles 7. This is the silence of a pastor who's lost. When the Lord appeared to Solomon at night, this is after that long prayer, and the, the choir sings and everything's wonderful, and they, they dedicate this to the Lord. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night, and he said to him, Dear Solomon, <laughs> I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. Isn't it funny that they dedicated the temple and then later on God says, oh, uh, yeah, I'll take it as a temple. If I close the sky and there's no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves. That's their response to that. And they pray and they seek my face and they turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and I will heal their land. God goes on to say, my eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to the prayer from this place. And I have now chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be here forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all times. <laughs> so the people and Solomon consecrate the temple and then later God literally consecrates the temple. But you know that, that, that in the middle of that, don't you? If my people who are called by my name but the, cons, the, 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 the meaning of it is found when you look at the construct of the, the, the sentence that 
if I do all these things, if I were to make it not rain to send grasshoppers to consume the land or pestilence on my people, and then as a response, my people that are called by my name would humble themselves, if that's their response, and they'd pray and they'd seek my face, and they'd turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven. In other words, he's telling Solomon and Solomon's people that whatever happens bad in your life, oh, I forget the screens there. Whatever happened bad in your life, pestilence, anything, if you just humble yourself, if you seek my face, if you turn from your wicked ways and you pray, then I will hear. I promise I'll be here. I will hear you heal your land. Solomon, as we know throughout Scripture and throughout his history, was not a perfect person, was he? He struggled with personal corruption under the weight of his rather extravagant lifestyle. He had wealth. He had power. He, it was incredible. But God blessed his leadership anyway. In a mighty way, when he put his whole heart and his soul into praying and fasting, into following God with a humble attitude, earnestly seeking God in repentance. If you'll just humble yourself and pray and seek my face. Now, a final one, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. You may have to go and read this uh, whole chapter by yourself to get the idea of what we're saying. We read about in Paul's letter, and he is telling us that we must live in repentance in 2 Corinthians 12, that we must live a life of confession. And it must be a part of our very being, Paul teaches us. We will, God will reveal himself to us through the guidance of the Holy Spirit in his word, only, what, what do you think? The other three scriptures are similar. Only when we have a correct posture before God. Only when we are repentant. You know, the old church used to call that fessed up. Confessed. Are you fessed up? Just like Jehoshaphat was. Just like Nehemiah was. They both said, God, we don't know what to do. It's up to you. Just like King Solomon was in all his glory, he still called out to God. He says, God, there's none like you. We can do nothing without you. Just like St. Paul, if you read that chapter. They were in a humble posture. Paul says that God had given him at the end of that chapter, a thorn in the flesh. You've heard about that, right? Well, do y'all know what the thorn in the flesh was? Because I don't. Everybody, everybody's guessing. Everybody's always guessing. It was something that kept him humble. He would ask God, take this away from me. And God would say, no, it's to keep you in the kind of person I want you to be. Friends, do you have a thorn in the flesh? Something that keeps you grounded. Something that is always bugging you. Maybe it's a physical thing. You know, I, I, you know, I, I want to use this opportunity to whine a little bit more about my back. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about my back and it's, it's gotten so much better. I'm like at 70, 80% back. But I'm starting to see that maybe there's parts of me that won't ever get better. And then I watched football yesterday. Now, when I was, say, let's say I was 20 to 25 years old, and I'd watch football, and in my mind's eye, which is a little weird kind of a look in my, if you look through my eyes, I'd say, I could have done that. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> a 20-year-old boy just kids himself, doesn't he? When they th but, but you see those, those fellas in their 20. 19, 20, 21 years old, and they're doing flips and they're getting hit in the back and they're crushing blows and they get up and they, you know, they're so uh, animated. Angela loves the, the dances that I, I can't even do them. 
So moonwalking and all that kind of stuff. And oh, they're just so proud of themselves and just they feel like Hulk, you know. And when I see that now, I think if I'd gotten hit like that, my heart would stop. I would just, I would cease to be. I would just splatter into a bucket at that point. <laughs> my physical level is not what it needs to be. I do have somewhat of a thorn in the flesh. It keeps me humble. But you know, sometimes there are, there's things that... Uh, uh, thorns in the flesh are just the things that keep your mind in the clouds. It's that simple. It's things that keep your eyes off of God and into the clouds. Sometimes it's a spiritual or physical or a sin nature. We don't know what Paul's was, but God was looking for an attitude of humility. And that thorn in the flesh kept Paul in God's perfect will. Paul never got out of line. He never bragged too much because he knew as soon as he bragged. Oh, do y'all know what some trusted theologians, the, what do they call theologians? Couldn't say the word. Do y'all know what some think that Paul's thorn in the flesh is? I better whisper this. <laughs> the people streaming won't believe me. Some people think that he was just ugly. <laughs> Can you imagine that his, that his thorn in the flesh was when you would see him, you know, you'd read these letters and you'd think, oh, that's got to be a guy riding on a white steed, you know? And you'd see him in person and he'd be a little guy, frumpy, ugly. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Could it have been that God gave him something that even on the inside might have made him ugly on the outside. Paul talks about, I'm, to, to the people he writes these letters to, he said, listen closely to my letters because when I come, I'm not near as impressive in person as I am in my letters. Isn't that hilarious? God is looking for an attitude of humility in you and I. God is pleased when we have an, a, a confessing attitude. A confessing spirit. Too long Christians have thought that confession is a downer. It's a wimpy spiritual experience. A negative, weak posture. Unmanly. And it's not. Let me tell you, it's a soul cleansing posture. If you're an athlete and you buffet your body and you become strong, then you have great overcoming power at your sport. And you're prepared for your event, your athletic event. If you're a follower of Christ, you, have, uh, you become a spiritual athlete. You buffet your spirit and you put your mind and your heart under submission to Jesus' will. Confession, humility, the soul-cleansing work. Spiritual push-ups is confession. We are using that to prepare ourselves for spiritual warfare. And by the way, my personal goal, and I hope you make it yours, is praying and fasting for 21 days in January. I'm going to remind you every week. That's where we're going to fight some spiritual battles, my friend. That's where God is going to reveal himself to us in a new and fresh way. However he so pleases, whatever his will is for our church and for each of us. The battle belongs to the Lord, says the song. Now, on the other hand, there's living in unrepentant sin. We've been talking about the believer and the follower and what they can do to grow and to be closer to God. But on the other hand, there's this other person, that, that this unrepentant heart that it tears down the spiritual man, unrepentant sin does. It eats at us like the erosion on the banks of a river. Unrepentant sin. It deprives us the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in our lives as believers. Just as one who would hold their breath too long or be choked. 
and deprived of a person of oxygen. Unrepentant sin cuts off our spiritual oxygen. Unrepentant sin grows like a spiritual cancer in us. I knew a person who sent all their tithes and their offerings to a televangelist. He had prophesied on live TV uh, that there would be a woman from her town that sounded very similar to her that should do this, send all her money to him. And so she did. And she believed she, uh, he was speaking to her that day. And so from that time forward in her life, she spent, and she took every dime she could out of her business, out of her personal finances, and sent to this man on TV. I, I don't know the story of what he did with the money, but it was her word from the Lord, if you've heard that phrase. And she hardly darkened the door of a local church from that time forward. This man on the TV became her pastor. And the more she said, he would even call her on the phone privately and pray with her. What a, what a nice pastor from three-fourths of the way around the world. Do you want to know the worst part of her story? Her sin trickled down, not to her, but to her, ch her children. Because she looked away from the local church and saw this man, they had such a sick, twisted view of the local church. I, I had to do business with them at one time, and I found all this out. that they, these, these two boys that I knew, as far as I knew, never worshiped God. They turned their back on God. They never, never even pretended to be believers. And what's interesting is that they would perpetuate their family business for financial gain by selling products, church products. I won't go into detail, or you, or you might know them. That's what they did for a living, not even loving God. She had to answer what God did for her. As far as I know, those two guys are going to spend eternity in hell because of the cold hearts that they established. But me, a pastor, what does that mean to me? What does all this mean to me? What brokenness and confession and repentance. The stories, the four stories that we had in Scripture. Well, do you know what I got out of this? I'm not going to lay it on you. I'm going I'm to lay something on me. This is what I found that I, Brother Paul, have to learn to be a pastor brokenness in brokenness, broken for sins. And not just the sins of myself, but the sins of my people. The sins of my community. It was a strong message this week when I read that to this little country preacher, and I honestly can't put into words how much God had convicted me that I'm not just responsible for what I do, but I need to be praying and confessing, confessing and repentant for the things that go on around me, asking for forgiveness often, calling on the power of the Holy Spirit to guide me through my pandemic of my soul. Last week we talked about how God gets his attention of his people and the prospects that the pandemic is that call. When he cries out to us, come back, come back to me. And so this week, we want to have an attitude of brokenness before him. I'm so sorry I'm late, but I've got three things I've got to say. You ready? I'm going to say them quickly. An attitude of brokenness before him. Our sins, sins of our people, sins of the country, sins of the world. We're supposed to be salt and light. The very least that we can do is confess the sins that are around us. Number one, confess the sins that we are broken about for what breaks God's heart. Oh, I wish I could preach a whole sermon on that. Maybe I will. We'll see. What is repugnant to God? What 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 is it that makes God weep? Let's pray for those things. Okay? Number 2. 
for our own sin. What makes us sick when we look in our mirror and we reflect back on what we said or did yesterday? We confess those sins. Number three, what makes us uneasy when we hear it or see it in the lives of others? We look out in our community and we see what's going on and we say, God, where are you in the midst of this, God? That's what we need to confess. Pray with me, please. Just remain in your seats for a moment. God, we acknowledge that we are weak and powerless without you. Only through you, God, can we overcome. Will you teach us more to confess our sins, Lord? The things that make you sick when you see them. The things that bring you grief, Lord, we confess. Lord, the things that we have done, we confess. Lord, the things that are going on around us, we confess. We ask you, Lord, to penetrate our life by the power of your Holy Spirit. Make us, renew us, make us alive again. Revive us, Lord. We will seek you. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, it's good to be in worship with you today. Have a wonderful day. Go in peace.